Welcome to today's Wednesday lunch here at the Divinity School. I'm Tara Moy, I'm the Director of Communications here. I organize this series, so it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our second to last lunch in the quarter. Um, I want to thank our chefs, Emily and Sam, and all the crew for this delicious meal. <laughs> Uh, we do ask that since it was cooked for you, specifically today, for you to clean up after yourselves on your way out. We're composting into that green thing, and you can put your leftovers and your bowls and plates right into that, and your silverware into our soapy vat, and that just helps us get out of here on time. You can also shut off your phones. That's a form of cleanliness right now. It's <laughs> So this is our second to last lunch. I just want to remind you that next week we're going to be hearing from Professor Coleman, Joseph Coleman. He's one of our Marty Center fellows here. Um, so this is your chance to hear from him. And sign up in advance, please. And then we're going to take a break until January 15th, I think, when we'll be hearing from Professor Taylor right here at this table. But today, I'm thrilled to be able to say that we're going to be hearing from another one of our new professors, Professor Nanakai Kakrishna, who joined us in July. Um, he's an intellectual historian of religion in South Asia. He came here after getting his PhD from Columbia University and then working most recently in the Department of South Asian Studies at Harvard University. He has two books in progress right now. One is called Love and Time of Scholarship and another one is called Left Hand Practice. But I don't think he's going to be talking about those books today. Uh, today we're going to have sort of an informal discussion with Professor Ray Kakishan and some of his other projects. So, um, hope you're still here and welcome you here tonight. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Taryn, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I, um, I thought that what I'd do today is that instead of kind of talk about my research and teaching in a, in a straightforward fashion, um, I thought I'd actually start by talking about um, invisible disability and, um, and how that affects uh, and influences my work um, as a scholar and teacher. Um, so uh, this is relevant to my research interests. I'm, I'm interested in scholarly lives. Um, I, I'm interested in how everyday life always already, um, is always already part of what we produce and, and how we approach uh, our life um, in these institutions. Um, and I wrote this essay that I'm going to read for you. It's published online. Um, basically to make explicit, mostly for myself, uh, the relationship between my very physical embodied life and my intellectual life. Um, something that I came very late to. Um, so if you're okay with it, I thought I'd share that with you today. We'll talk about it. So it's called Hemophilon. Uh, several months ago, I watched an interview with two North Korean refugees about the process of their resettlement in South Korea. They spoke in some detail about their circuitous routes of escape one through China and Mongolia, another through Vietnam and Laos, as seekers of asylum never fully afforded state protection. I don't know the circumstances behind it. Government-sponsored repatriation is never innocent. But the interviewees spoke openly about their struggles to assimilate into South Korean society. Stigmatized for their provincial accents, suspected of espionage and disloyalty, shocked by the sudden transition from pre-industrial to advanced capitalist society, modernity's most classical narrative. While describing the difference in values between the two cultures, one of the interviewees revealed that he had attempted suicide in his last years of high school. When pressed, the young man, slender and pale, with a full head of curly black hair, replied that he was driven to despair by having to compete with his fellow students to get ahead in life. Not only was he at an educational disadvantage, uh, he was also chronically ill, he said, since he suffered from hemophilia. When I heard this, my heart sank and my stomach leapt, clashing at the nexus of pity and fear. Hemophilia is a rare genetic blood disorder that affects the clotting process and requires constant access to expensive medication in order to prevent hemorrhage triggered by small injuries. It's also one I know well. 
I had a severe version of the disorder, type A, factor VIII deficiency. For this man to have been a stateless refugee with such a condition, whatever its degree of severity, is almost unimaginable. That he mentioned it first in the context of his academic anxiety is, to me, even more troubling. What kind of society transforms disability into desperation? And what kind of political economy structures it? As an excellent trait, hemophilia primarily affects men, while women are carriers. The Hindu in me believes that this is karmic retribution for generations of patriarchy. <laughs> My mother says I was a leech in a past life. <laughs> now, most modern histories of hemophilia highlight its presence in the royal families of Britain and Russia, the Romanovs in particular. For years, my only point of reference had been Prince Alexei and his wild healer Rasputin. The hypnotic healing procedures, the hastening of the end of Tsarist rule, the horrible murders of the royal family. More recently, I was surprised to find a hemophiliac in Haruki Murakami's Kafka on the Shore, a gender-fluid librarian who drives a flashy sports car and offers mysterious advice. But there are other genealogies as well. Sanskrit legends tell of the demon Raktabija, blood seed, who fought with the great goddess Durga in cosmic battle. She sliced him up into pieces, but from every drop of his blood that hit the ground, another Raktabija sprang up, stronger than ever. The goddess finally defeated him by calling upon the dark, ferocious, bloodthirsty Kari, who sped about lapping up each drop before it could sprout. In this age of discord, Perhaps hemophilia is Raktabija's return. After all, gods and demons reincarnate too. Having hemophilia was an intensely private thing for me as a child. Of course, all my friends knew, and they were caring enough to maintain the line between prankish and protective. But what I mean by private is the sense that what I had was uniquely my own. I never entertained the idea of attending one of the many summer camps for young people with blood disorders that the local children's hospital offered. Besides the fact that there was little chance of meeting girls at a hemophilia, <laughs> I did not want to meet anyone who presented a different picture of something that I thought was impenetrably individual. What I had could not become an object of shared experience. It was a silent, concealed badge of difference, yet one by which I refused to be defined. But there was also the fear of being marked forever as physically other. Varieties of this fear have pursued me throughout my life. It's easy to understand the teenage turmoil of feeling unattractive and unwanted. But there are also ethical vulnerabilities. As an adult aspiring to solidarity with grassroots activists, I've had to wonder, how do I put my body on the line when it's the weakest defense I possess? If I've never thought to reflect openly on what it means to live with hemophilia, it's because I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm fortunate to have had the resources, the privileges, and the support I need to sustain a healthy, happy life. I grew up in a comfortable home, never wanted for daily needs, and was supported financially throughout my education. Apart from a strong reluctance to travel, an indefensible hatred of physical exercise, and a progressive limp from moderate arthritis, the psychological and physical effects of my condition have been manageable. To maintain this fragile equilibrium, however, involves daily intravenous infusions of a wildly expensive synthetic clotting agent. Over the year, veins tire, scars congeal, and more metaphorically, nerves fray. Some disabilities are only invisible until they show. In drooping eyes, in punctured skin, in hesitant steps. It's not pleasant to think that one encounters the world deficient, that to become normal requires daily painful artifice. But there is no normal. There are only shades of injury, some genetic, some generational. At the clinic I used to attend in New York City, I was the model patient because I could sit with my legs folded. The waiting room was a portrait of old white men in wheelchairs, arthritic black men with pronounced limps, grizzled Latino men with Medicaid wristbands, humorless Asian men with rickety walkers. Blood is the great leveler. Disorders do not discriminate. 
Capitalism, on the other hand, does with spectacular brutality. A couple of years ago, the homegrown plutocracy called the US Senate tried to strip millions of citizens from access to affordable health care. As if it were not enough to try and survive in a society that only values humans for their productive capacity. Freedom is a historically hollow word for many people in this country whose bodies have been chained to the unholy machinery of civilization. As for those bodies unable to serve this all-consuming fire, to what god will they appeal? In the case of one Korean student, the stigma of sickness in a capitalist culture nearly killed him when statelessness did not. As a professor, then, I'm compelled to foreground the health and welfare of my students above all other considerations. What is a humanities education if it does not resist these inhumanities? The pressure to achieve individual success at the expense of others conditions much of contemporary academic life. My disciplinary training compels me differently. Philology, or in the broadest sense, how to make sense of texts, requires collaboration with the living and the dead. One reads with you, and the other reads through you. We do not simply work together, but rely on each other, just like I hold my partner's hand to walk when my arthritis flares up. For years, I believed that my choice of intellectual career was separate from my physical condition. Now, I wonder if J.M. Kutzi is the act of slow reading meant for a slow man. Two. When I was a child, my Sanskrit teacher, a four foot eleven sprightly woman with a PhD and a persistent wheeze, uh, told me a funny talk, a clever verse. Uh, attributed to the 12th century poet and philosopher Sri Harsha. As a young boy, Sri Harsha was so prolific and so unintelligible that his uncle gave him some lentil soup to dull his senses. After a while, he asked Sri Harsha how he was doing, only to receive the following complex alliterative reply meant to resemble chewing, one that I still remember by heart. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle, I'm gnashing on a mash so my mind may be mushed. <laughs> Recently, I happened upon this hemistage again in a book on Sri Natha, the poet who wrote a Telugu version of Sri Harsha's intensely learned and beautiful epic poem, the Naisha Dhyacharika. I suspect that the verse, like my teacher, was of Telugu origin. Only what I always thought she was trying to tell me was not that I was precocious, but that it was okay to nibble on snacks while I studied. <laughs> the misremembered lesson had its own moral, one quite appropriate to Sanskrit culture. Learning and pleasure are equally important, and ideally, they would become indistinguishable. Her kindness and patience with me, and her delight in my unsteady progress, was its own evidence. The reason I value philological education is just this that it is pleasurable. The ethics of that pleasure, that opening up and relishing, is clear to me in a world of dangerously narrowing possibilities, in which pleasure, like labor and resources, is squeezed out of the people and redistributed upward for a predatory field. It was the most insurgent philologist of them all, Malcolm X who exemplified the potent combination of a love for learning widely and a passion for fighting injustice. He says, you can believe me that if I had the time right now, I would not be one bit ashamed to go back to, into any New York City public school and start where I left off in the ninth grade and go on through a degree, because I don't begin to be academically equipped for so many of the interests that I have. For instance, I love languages. I wish I were an accomplished linguist. I would just like to study. I mean, ranging study, because I have a wide open mind. I'm interested in almost any subject you can mention. <laughs> Malcolm's activism on behalf of the poor and disenfranchised was enabled by his already extraordinary skill with language, from reading the dictionary cover to cover in prison to debating conservative commentators on television. And yet he sought academic qualification in the subject, not for prestige, but to satisfy his curiosity. He located his humanity, or his princeliness, to follow Ossie Davis, 
in his ability to take back language and history from their abusers, to give them back to the people. Philology was at once pleasure and power. Could it also be politics? There's a story that circulates among Sanskritists of an apocryphal meeting between Eric Frauval, the Nazi German scholar of Buddhism, and Sylvain Levy, the French Jewish scholar of Indian religion and literature. The story goes that during the Nazi invasion of Paris, Frauvalner accompanied an SS raid in order to seek out the great Levy. When he found his residence, he instructed everyone to wait outside. After engaging Levy in a long conversation about Sanskrit philology, he departed and told the guards that there was no one home and that they should go on their way. But the meeting was impossible for even more reasons than the most obvious, that Levy died in 1935, years before the invasion. <laughs> but I think the moral is more than simply that respect for learning transcends regimes of hatred and violence. It's that when the world is falling apart around you, or you yourself may be complicit in inflicting unspeakable suffering, one of the most radical methods of resistance is to stop. Philology here is not just about slowing down, but actually stop to think, to turn over different possibilities, to debate options, to explore the intertextual archive, to enter the minds of those who stopped long ago. The late Srinivas Aravamudan, in his book Guru English, likens the study of the humanities under the threat of nuclear war to the setting of the Bhagavad Gita, the philosophical conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, which takes place in between two armies, arrayed for apocalyptic battle. It isn't clear how long time stops, whether they are simply prolonging the inevitable. Krishna says that everyone present has already been slain to die. But in those hours of poetry in question, the reader experiences an eternity, from grand cosmic visions to inner moral psychology that may revise completely what they think is real and true. Um, before returning to complete my thoughts on disability and education, I want to share what Sanskrit philology looks like in practice, or to paraphrase Harunaga Isaacson, the task of understanding people's minds. Uh, a few years ago, a colleague and I teamed up to conjecture a fix for a corrupt line in the Guru Nata Parama show, remembering my teacher, reminiscences of my teacher, by Madhuraja, who was writing in Madurai in present-day Tamil Nadu, uh, sometime after the 12th century. Madhuraja's poem was in praise of the 10th century Kashmiri philosopher Abhinava Gupta, whose writings made their way to the south of India not long after their composition. Now, verse 29 in the Kashmir Sanskrit text series edition reads as follows, and I put it up here. Um, it's mostly complete, but there's clearly some gaps. Um, even without knowing the rather rare 17 syllable meter, uh, it's called Nagataka or Kokilaka, um, it's clear that there are problems in the first quarter of this verse. The compound word, which is comprised of individual words separated by hyphens, I've separated them, and linked by many possible relationships of meaning, is obviously missing syllables, which I've marked here with asterisks. The splitting of the first word from that compound disturbs what should otherwise be an ele elegant, elongated two-line compound, meant to agree syntactically with the compound word in the third quarter of the verse. The meter, a fixed pattern of heavy and light syllables, uh, in each quarter, at least provides a structure within which to implot the required syllables. But what could they be? And where? And why? Well, what we want the verse to say, what it wants to tell us, is an extended conceit about the B that is the speech, Vagbhamari, perched on Abhinavagupta's lotus lips, Vaganamuja. This B slash speech has the amazing ability to turn even a rank idiot like me, God Amordham Mom, into an eloquent speaker, abuzz with words, Mukhari Gurudev. For those who hang around it, the Bhakta Jana, are purified, Pavitrita, by its very sound, Dvani, its contented drone of absorption, Majjana, you see we're moving backwards, in the fragrance, Parimala, emitted by the stream of honey, Makaranda Dhani, that is the discourse in the, of the Lord, the, it all breaks down. 
We were so close. Now, Madhuranja had proven himself a close reader of Abhinava's works and frequently seemed to refer to their content. So when, in the course of a completely unrelated discussion, my colleague showed me verse 5 of Abhinava Gupta's Ishwara Pratyabhinya Vivakri something stood out to me. So here, Abhinava Gupta talks about his education as a kind of progressive and transgressive kind of ritual. First, he's purified by a full bath in grammar study. He worships then the deity in his heart with flowers of critical thinking, plucked from the vine of wisdom, blossoming at the root of sound logic. Then, having drunk to his heart's content of beautiful literature, the wine of ambrosia, he now reposes in the arms of his lover, namely, what I've put in, um, what I bolded here, discourse on the non-duality of the Lord, Ishwara the Lord being Shiva. Now, this last quote, which I bolded, um, if we splice that phrase into Madhuraja's verse, suddenly everything makes sense, both metrically and semantically. Suddenly, now we have Madhura Maheshwara Dvayakatha, Makaranda Tuni. Now, the honey, Makaranda, is clearly metaphorically identified with Ishwara Dvayakatha, discourse on the non duality of Shiva, and it itself is Madhura sweet. We can reposition that adjective at the beginning of the context. Not only does my conjecture fit the meter, it can plausibly be explained as another of Madhuraja's clever allusions. Now, before we could congratulate ourselves on the historic accomplishment, uh, we realized that Vida Agman's 1949 edition of the Guru Nata Paramasha had more or less the same reading. Um, it had, well, it had more or less the correct reading the whole time. Um, it was simply not typed in properly in the KSTS edition, which we were using, um, which made use of two additional manuscripts, but apparently little use of proofreading. Um, now, it, it wasn't entirely correct. Raghavan's manuscript read Madhura Maheshwara Kathadvai, which flips the two words, which he amended a bit heavy handed to Madhura Maheshata Dvaya Katha. Um, it doesn't work that well. Um, ours, however, corrects the original metathesis, uh, and it maintains the reference to Abhidhava Gupta's verse in the Ishvara Pratibhidhya Vivitidhya Mushi. Uh, but in this instance, the scribal error was a thoroughly modern one. I recently coined a German portmanteau for this exact situation. Frau-Richtigkeit. <laughs> that is to say, frau plus Richtigkeit, sad correctness. Um, the feeling when you discover that an emendation you made is corroborated by another textual witness, only to realize that you can no longer display your genius in published writing. <laughs> There's still a lesson here somewhere. Maybe it's about paying attention to the misprisions of modernity. Maybe it's just that Bhagavan read everything. For my colleague and I to pause, to step out of time and into Madhuraja's mind, and in an unintended way into Bhagavan's mind, was to break with what Paul Griffiths would call consumerist reading. Although we didn't replace it with religious reading and allow our heart and mind to be nourished by the source text, that didn't lessen the experience. For it was enough to think the way another person thought, to bring them into our gathering, to treat them as a companion, an intellectual exercise begun in friendship, ending in friendship. Philology, as Victor Klemperer knew well, has unexpected consequences. It may not save us, nothing will save us. But every act that prizes truth from the grips of obfuscation is a noble one in these dark times. Part three. I'm almost done. The image of Christ on the cross puts me in mind of a great many things. The ultimate symbol of universal suffering. The rejection of the infinite desirability of mortal life. The terrible consequence of nonviolent resistance to power. But sometimes, when I see that broken, beautiful body, I think of the hemophilia. Both, after all, are drenched in blood. For the severe among us, the blood spells out spontaneously, not to wash away the sins of the world, but to stain it, to remind it of our presence. 
the more invisible the disability, the more the desire to be seen. The chemophilologist then is a kind of secular witness, offering an account of truth, pain, sensitivity, and care all at once, a virtue of the most humane scholars that I've known. That I once sought to separate my intellectual and physical lives and now want to integrate them openly is neither new nor unique. It's simply the sort of reflection I think is urgent for a society, civil, academic, and otherwise, that's so frayed and fractured, unable to reckon with the violence and sickness of its past and present. It is not enough to have had a stable, safe life, though that's the bare minimum that we must demand for all. Life, to be life, has to be a flourishing for the poor, for the weak, for the disabled. If I, motivated by the recognition of the care I perceive, am trying to cultivate the same within my closest relationships, I see no reason not to have the same attitude towards the texts I read, the students I teach, and the writing I never published. I was born on the wrong end of a genetic malfunction, a code misread, a link snapped off. By no effort or merit of my own, I've been made to feel whole. So I try and fail, try again, fail again, and feel better, to direct that sense of fullness to others. Sometimes those others are, like me, corrupted texts. Sometimes they're loved ones. And sometimes, because love, life is unkind, they're just out for blood. I can help with that. <laughs> Sort of time for discussion and questions and whatever you want to talk about in the time we have left. Yeah. So much in that talk. The word corruption. Why do you think, how does it have the range of meanings that it has? How can it mean politician taking the bribe and a syllable that should be an F in its an S instead? How? What is it in that? What do they have in common? Um, I hope I don't have much in common with politicians. <laughs> um, but um, and we could add the third, the, the corruption of the body, right? The, yeah. the ultimate meaning, right? The, the base meaning is the corruption of the body, which we get political corruption on the one hand and grammatical corruption on the other. But there was a, that seemed to me to be a link that yeah. you were making in your um, very interesting talk, and I wonder why is that link there? Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, I said it uh, towards the end, and then also somewhere else in the talk, there is a sort of um, uh, distancing from that notion. Mm -hmm. um, the notion that there is no moment, uh, that there are only shades of injury. Um, so, you know, uh, it tries to move us away from a notion there that there is no one a pure text. original. Uh, uh, that we have to fix. There's no uncorrupted text, there's no uncorrupted body, and there's no uncorrupted body. <laughs> it does seem to be the case, though. Yeah. Um, you mentioned not liking to travel. Um, I would I would have imagined, uh, given your uh, your scholarly achievements, that you have traveled uh, quite a bit. And how how have you reconciled um, your likes and dislikes and your desires? Yeah, thanks for asking about that. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I was dragged up and down the length and breadth of the Indian subcontinent. Um, I you know I all the way from Kedarnath to Kanyakumari, um, and uh, mostly on pilgrimage. Um, and in place, so, you know, um, it's been so interesting, if you talk to my family, to think about the places I've infused, like 30,000 feet in the air at 5 a.m. outside a mountain cliff and all these things. Um, and, you know, um, I travel for research and, and, and um, 
conferences and work and so forth. Um, but none of that is anywhere near as rigorous as what I did when I was a kid. And so I feel like I sort of got it out of my system. Uh, you know, that there was sort of some scholar of Boston out there that I had to you know, sort of um, experience. And okay, I'm kind of done with that part of my life. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, the way the, the hesitance basically comes from um, wanting to be sure that I know where I'll be in the morning. Um, and that I'll basically, you know, be able to face the day from a place of security. Um, and very often with travel, especially in remote places, that's like the easiest thing. So, um, but, uh, but academic travel, at least for textual scholars, usually to more sort of different kinds of centers than pilgrimage centers. So, yeah. So you talked about how growing up your hemophilia was very private and something that only your intimates knew. And now you publish this online. And I'm wondering, I mean, part of this piece is telling the story of how you got here. But I was wondering if you could actually talk about how it felt to put that online or even to be in this room, right? Because it's presencing the invisible in a particular way. And so I was wondering if you could reflect on that. Yeah, um, I think part of the the, um, the impetus was that um, after getting my uh, degree, my PhD degree, I had um, some time away from the sort of um, the day to day of academia, and that I had sort of a postdoctoral research fellowship, and then I had a position that was um, you know I was part of the faculty, but I was not a full time member, so I didn't have to go to meetings and things like that. So it was. Um, However much being at Oxford and Harvard is on the margins, I was on the margins of those places. Um, and it, I think it gave me the freedom to um, do two things. One was embrace my inner dilettante. Um, and, um, and the second was really to, to think about what I had been trained to do. Um, and one of those things that I've been trained to do was to separate these two things. Um, my everyday life and um, my what I was being trained to produce. Um, now, that may seem exceptional to people for whom they are actively trained to bring those things together in fields that make that kind of autobiographical uh, approach um, central. I mean, you have anthropologists, ethnographers, and so forth. Um, but um, I didn't have that kind of um, training. So then having the freedom not to be in a space where I was disciplined or trained basically gave me the freedom and the, um, uh, it allowed me to, to think differently about writing. Um, I found that writing was such a circumscribed activity in the kinds of journals and you know, kinds of spaces that, that you were allowed to publish work. You had to siphon off everything that went into it. Um, and again, that's an accident of my discipline the field and the kinds of what writing that I publish. Um, so being asked to write for this other thing. So by the way, this essay is published in a, um, an online journal called The Revealer. It's a blog run by the NYU Center for Religion and Media. Uh, and a good friend of mine from graduate school was then the editor of The Revealer and asked me to sort of contribute some things. And I basically got to think about um, yeah, what, go, what is always already present in what we write but that we don't always get the opportunity to articulate. Um, and so uh, one result was this, um, and the other um, was actually about um, uh, working with my mom on a research project. Um, and so that's a separate article entirely. Uh, yeah. So you said that you learned in your discipline to separate project and the academic. I've always argued that all good scholars is highly autobiographical. And you can never separate what you feel about all sorts of things. Um, so I disagree with you there. So what do well, you think? Well, maybe if you had trained me, it would have been different. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that we always put ourselves into our work in one way do. or another? I think we do implicitly, and I was just learning to make it explicit. Yeah. 
told, but I, not always explicitly, but why you want to do things, that when you think about things, things you're frightened of, the things that you like, even though you think you shouldn't like them, that all comes out of, out of life. Yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't trained to write about that. And I, but even I, when you're not writing about it, it's why you do Sanskrit, it's yeah. why you joke when you write. I mean, it's yeah. who you are, is in everything that you do. It is in everything. Yeah. And I was just making that explicit. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to actually go back to the first question that was asked by Mr. Donner. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, what we came to be sort of conclusion, though, that there are three kinds of, you know, I mean, that there is corruption in the body. You know, there are no texts and bodies and, and even political systems that are all corrupted. And, and that kind of would appear then to put us in a, in a position of, of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what sort of responses can be warranted, if it is the same response, or what sort of different responses can be uh, can be asked of us so that we don't merely sort of acquiesce to those conditions. Yo, man, you, you, you gotta write about that, dude. Like, I don't know how to answer this. What, what's up, what's up? I said, especially with the last one. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have the answer to that, but yeah, that's a, that's right for another essay. <laughs> maybe in the reveal or maybe somewhere else. That's great. Thanks, thanks for that thought. Um, I'll be taking that home. <laughs> could you repeat that? Uh, could you repeat that to me? Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, basically, we have different, you know, sorts of uh, states of powerlessness in regards to, like, our own bodies. Um, and, and with text that we can never really, you know, we can never get the uncorrupted text, and then also political systems. So, um, given that, how can we respond in such a way as to not merely acquiesce to that condition? Yeah, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta think about that. Somebody had a. Yeah, I have a question. Um, in political studies, we talk a lot about self disclosure. Like yeah. Between the professor and a student, or a student's professor, or whatever. I don't know how you approach that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I had to think about that at different levels because, mm -hmm. as a person who inhabits a very politically charged mm -hmm. field, I have to, I'm always already read as a certain person, irrespective of the space that I enter, whether that's the community center, whether that's the temple, whether that's the classroom. Um, so that's always present um, on that level. Um, so that's one element of self disclosure. Um, I like to kind of, um, and so there's a couple ways you can do that. One is to sort of come out guns blazing and say, this is exactly what I believe. And at least I can control the narrative in that particular respect. Um, and that, there's a, that's a salutary way. But actually, something like this is, is another way of doing that, which is to sort of, um, I don't know, change the terms on which that, uh, that kind of question is asked. Uh, very often, it's about, do you belong or do you not belong? And this kind of gets at, well, what is belonging? And who is asking the question? And so, just changes the terms. Basically. Um, so, I, I guess this is an oblique way of, of doing that. Now, that's just one element of self-disclosure. There's there's all sorts of issues of race and class and et cetera, et cetera. So, this, I just am answering based on that one uh, thing that's saving. Yeah. To sort of, um, I guess, shift focus a little bit. I was really interested when you talked about. I think you were sort of talking about like a politics of like slowness and stopping and about that idea is like resistance in some way. And I guess I'm usually used to thinking of like resistance as a very active thing, so I'm really curious about that idea. It was a very Gandhian kind of approach. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, so that says anything. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, um, at some, somewhere along the line, I'd, I'd really like to do a course on uh, Gandhi and, um, and uh, yeah, modern, so modern Indian religion in general. So, uh, yeah, we can, you know, uh, he's an activist and a pacifist, right? Um, and so how to pull those things together. Uh, just if there's no reason. No, go ahead. Huh, you're talking about self-revelation and who you are and how you belong. And of course, I'm in the position of becoming increasingly concerned about the question of cultural appropriation and the argument that you must reveal who you are and in deal you must be part of the tradition of which you speak or else you don't have a right to speak about that tradition. 
which, if widely adopted, would certainly be the end of comparative religion and I think of the humanities in general. So how do you deal with the fact that in many ways you belong, but in some ways you don't belong? To the traditions that you work on. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you're the you're, you're the master of writing about um, people who are masquerading and, and who are not really seen and who are not known. Um, so, um, you know, so maybe I'll answer that in a in a in a way that. Um, so I've been thinking about different approaches to the study of Hinduism, in the sense of um, um, the sort of. There's a kind of liberal, sort of universalist approach. That is to say, that there are things here that can appeal to anyone, right? Uh, and and uh, you know, it's, I guess a pluralist, universalist kind of um, mm -hmm. ethic. That there are things in here that anybody can, you know, and that is the job of multicultural education. But what if we were to think of Hinduism as an actually obsessively particularized tradition mm -hmm. right? that is obsessed with thinking about this place and this time and this family and this caste and gender and this particular sort of configuration of identity, right? Um, that always already colors your way of approaching the universe and the world. Now, the hierarchical dimensions of that are, are uh, obvious and everywhere to see, but there's also a certain affinity with, for, for people who feel like their identities are erased uh, in a certain classroom space. Uh, where the universalism is something that doesn't acknowledge the particularity of their experiences. So there's, in a weird way, there's something that is actually uh, uh, that, 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 that way of obsessively analyzing and deconstructing and reconstructing has to say uh, to, uh, uh, to somebody who, who feels um, that they want to and need to hold on to the particular while not being reduced to that, um, to that person. That's a kind of abstract way of thinking about it. I'm interested in that. I think something along that lines is exactly what needs to be on. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, that talk was uh, very intimate and inspiring, and I don't have a question that will match it. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, I really appreciate your meme game uh, oh, thank you. in the applications for classes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, so, you know, one thing that I'm very happy that uh, my and Sarah's predecessor is here, because one of the ethics that I'd like to carry on is that of fun, and having fun, <laughs> and that scholarship should be fun, and, uh, and part of acknowledging our life uh, that always feeds into it is getting towards that, that idea of having fun. That might be the perfect ending point, unless there are any more questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.